Hey, I'm Jake G. Water, and welcome to the Virtual Production Indie Film Guide. This video is split into two parts. Part one will give an overview of our problem and some background on why we have to deal with color spaces at all. Part one is more theoretical and educational, so if you just want to get your hands dirty, definitely skip to part two. Uh, there we're going to create a 3D LUT in DaVinci Resolve, which will convert between two color spaces. And we can apply that to an outgoing HDMI or SDI signal. Uh, we'll make use of this in yet another video, but the techniques should be general enough that you can apply them to any situation where you need to convert your camera's color space during live production. So let's first set up the scene and explain why we're doing what we're doing. For reference, I'm using a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, Decklink 8K, and Unreal Engine 4.26. So uh, here's an example actor against a green screen being filmed by our camera. Now we want to live composite this footage into Unreal against the virtual backdrop. The footage is fed live over HDMI so that our composite scene is immediately available to the director. Further, we're going to record the live footage such that it could be edited right away. Uh, but the live recording is going to be a bit lower quality than we like, so we're also going to record a raw file, uh, the original footage, and save it to a local SSD on the camera. We do this that we can eventually like swap out the live footage with the SSD footage, and this will be a post-production step. So this introduces the first problem. Uh, we want to save the raw file on the USB hard drive. Uh, this will allow maximum flexibility during post-production. The raw footage is saved using the Blackmagic raw color space, and it'll maintain you know, the highest quality version of this footage. We can play with it as much as we want in post-production. Now, since the live footage over HDMI is immediately being processed by Unreal, uh, we have to deal with the fact that Unreal uses the sRGB linear color space. Uh, thus, somewhere in between the camera and Unreal, we need to ensure that our live footage is also in the sRGB linear color space. Something has to convert it. Now, I do have another video talking about how to use OCIO to transform your color spaces within Unreal, but unfortunately, OCIO does not know how to transform any Blackmagic color spaces. We can actually confirm this. Uh, looking into the OCIO config file on GitHub, if we search for Blackmagic, nothing comes up. You can search for uh, other camera manufacturers and they will show up. Their transforms will show up, but for Blackmagic, it's not there. This is an unfortunate part of dealing with OCIO and Blackmagic, but we're going to work around the limitation. So one option might be just don't transform the colors, feed the raw footage directly into Unreal. Uh, we can do this, but unfortunately, if we do it, the colors are going to look really dull next to the vibrant uh, colors provided by Unreal. And this happens because we're interpreting a logarithmic color space as a linear one. Now we could sit and like fiddle with the color dials and try to like manually dial it in, but it's still not going to be quite correct and it's not really solving the core problem. What we should really do is transform the color space coming out of the camera to something that OCIO recognizes. It can really be anything, but I want to use Rec709 because then I can view the HDMI footage on a monitor without needing any further transforms. Once in Rec. 709, OCIO can easily transform that to sRGB linear inside of Unreal. Uh, because there are Rec. 709 transforms to find in OCIO config, I show you them right there. Uh, Rec. 709 and sRGB have the same color primaries, so we're not really sacrificing anything in terms of the size of our color space, so it should be safe to use. All right, feel free to skip this part, but I'm going to go into detail on why cameras use these nonlinear color spaces and how HDMI fits into the picture. Now these examples are going to be correct enough, but I'm sure there's missing pieces here and there. Uh, I'm going through this though to help fill your understanding of the problem. It should help you navigate the world of color management a little better. So looking at this example, uh, let's start by imagining there is an image on the left and it's coming into the lens and focusing on the camera sensor. The sensor is a piece of technology. It turns uh, light into voltages. Now there uh, are a lot of pieces in between, but at the end of the day, the camera is going to read the voltages on the sensor and just use an analog to digital converter and turn it into a 16-bit number representing how high or low that voltage is. Uh, now you could also say it's just how bright the light was because they're going to correspond like linearly one-to-one. -one. Uh, now there may be some processing steps in between here and there, but this is the gist of what's going on inside the electronics. So, first question, why not just emit the raw sensor data as your video footage? Turns out that's not too far from what a raw file actually does, but those can get very large very fast. Uh, here, for example, is a calculation of a 16-bit raw 4K 24 frames per second video file. And if we go through and multiply all these numbers out, what we'll find is that 
uh, it uses 1.2 gigabytes per second of data, which on a one terabyte hard drive only gives you 13 minutes. Most cameras, including ours, compress the data using a series of transforms, which will attempt to reduce the file size while maintaining the image quality. First transform, and the one that impacts color space the most, is this linear to log conversion. So 16 bits of color depth is a lot of data to store about color, because you're not just storing 16 bits per pixel, it's 16 bits per color channel. Uh, and most of our TVs only do 8-bit. Uh, in fact, buying a 10-bit monitor can cost, you know, several thousand dollars. But filmmakers like to use 10 to 16 bits because uh, it gives them a lot of flexibility during post-production. Let's kind of go through an example as to why filmmakers like these large bit depths. So here's an example scene. You're a director, you're filming the, you know, latest, greatest teen action thriller. And you want to represent an actor standing in this dark school hallway. Now, right now, there's very little suspense about the scene. You know, it just looks like an average school day. So the director decides to play with the lighting in post-production and attempts to darken the hallway. Uh, a, a straight darkening of the hallway is fairly easy, but you could argue that this doesn't look that good. It's almost like the background is just disappearing and, you know, the actor is like in a spotlight in the middle. To me, it feels artificial and it looks more like they're in a play than a real scene. In this case, if we had a, a narrow bit depth, like only eight bits of color, you know, there might not be enough in the information in the shadows to do anything more than this with it. Now, if you have enough detail uh, in the shadow because you shot the scene in 16 bit, you know, then you could darken the scene, but like punch up the contrast. And I think it adds a lot of texture to the background, you know, and, and it's a much more interesting scene. And I would argue that it's actually adding the tension that we're looking for. So this is definitely a dark hallway, but you know, I can perceive a lot of the, the, the surrounding, the background. It feels like the actor's really there. So this is one of the reasons why directors like to have as much information stored in the camera as possible, because it gives them a lot of room to play around in post-production. Uh, it's expensive to refilm scenes. So you just want to capture as much and as everything as you can on the first attempt. Great, so we understand why people want 16 bits of color data coming in, but what is this linear to log conversion? And the short answer is it's a mathematical trick. It's not really any more sophisticated than that, but uh, if you're interested, let's go through why the trick works. Well, I told you we're going into detail, and if you didn't take me seriously, I bet you are now. Uh, I wanna make sure you really understand why these logarithmic color spaces are used. So here's two graphs, and they represent two different ways to compress your data from a higher bit depth to a lower bit depth. And if I plotted the 16 bits to 10 bit conversion, you know, these graphs would be very hard to read. So instead for educational purposes, I'm gonna go from eight bits to four bits. Uh, now we're gonna use these graphs to take image data from a camera sensor and convert it into a smaller bit depth that we can save to a file. Now we're gonna see that the log graph on the right does a better job of preserving image data that the human eye cares about. And as such, we're gonna make the file sizes smaller while preserving the image quality. Uh, so we should definitely be using these log graphs. Now I'm gonna go through this step-by-step step to make sure you really understand how to read these graphs. So on the bottom, uh, we have our camera. Now each pixel in the sensor of that camera is gonna emit a single number for now. Uh, and it's just how bright the light is and it's linear. So double, like double the brightness would be double the number. So this is sort of like a black and white sensor, but it's fairly easy to imagine a color version. You just do this three times once for each color channel. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on two example pixel values here because I think that will help illustrate what this whole chart is doing. Uh, the first of which is the middle gray or 18% gray. Now, 18% gray uh, represents uh, like a card that reflects 18% of the light back. And um, if we were to calculate 18% along the way from 0 to 256, then we're going to end up around uh, 46. That's the, that's the tick that the 18% gray card should be at. So if this camera is you know, calibrated to the scene, like proper exposure, and it's reading the 18% gray value, that value will be 46. So we go straight up from there to hit the graph. Then we go left. And you can see that uh, that value is going to encode to the number two. And remember, on the left-hand side, we only have 16 values. Where on the bottom, we have many more. We're going from eight bits to four bits. So this is how we read the graph. Let's do the same thing for pure white. Now, again, if your camera is calibrated, the pure white card is not going to be the max brightness. Pure white is like the most reflective something can be. So it's actually a little bit below the max brightness. And in this example, it's around 200. 
So to calculate what that should be in our final file, we go up from 200, hit the graph, and then go left. So that's going to come in uh, around 11. So in this example, there are about five values brighter than pure white and only two values darker than middle gray. So what's the problem? The problem is that the way we perceive middle gray, we perceive it to be actually in between black and white. Now this is a feature of how our brains and eyes work. It's not about physics. Physics, physically, where we put middle gray was correct at 18%. But our brains are just as interested in everything below middle gray as it is everything above middle gray. So I've drawn a box around everything which is below middle gray. And you can see that it's barely anything at all. We've dedicated most of the space in this file, stuff we don't care about. So it would make much more sense if we kind of rejiggered this equation to give middle gray and things below it more space in the output file. So here's the same situation, but with the log curve instead of the linear curve. Uh, following middle gray up from 18%, we hit the line much higher now. And when we go left, it, sends, it ends up somewhere around 11. That was actually our previous white point. But the white point in this one is moved up. Now it's around 14. So you can see in the logarithm example on the right-hand side, the gray box is roughly halfway up the left-hand uh, axis. So this is a much better allocation of bits in the output file. We're dedicating about half of the output file to half of what we care about. Again, this is a mathematical trick. And the only reason we're using it is because we want to reduce the file size without losing out on image quality. It's, it's not about physics. It just depends on how our human eye and brain work. Now, because it is subjective, there's no one standard on how to convert from linear to log. It doesn't even have to be log. In fact, most camera manufacturers and other equipment manufacturers have their own formulas. Uh, this is even seen as a competitive feature where, you know, some camera manufacturers claim their formula works better at preserving colors people are interested in. Now, whatever conversion we do, eventually the signal needs to be reconstructed as a linear signal before we can, you know, show the image properly. The same intensity of light that we uh, measured in the camera has to be recreated on the other side, uh, or at least the ratio of all the light levels have to be recreated. Uh, the physics is very linear here, so whatever signal comes in, we want you know, a, a linear version of that signal coming out the other side. Now, in most practices, monitors actually don't take in linear signals, but they do convert from a nonlinear standard like Rec. 709 or sRGB into a linear voltage before illuminating their display. So in the example I have here, I'm just assuming that these monitors are inputting a linear signal. Uh, but wrapping this up, there's no way to escape these mathematical tricks. They're just tricks that are so baked into video and filmmaking that you they're just part of it now. I, I do hope you better understand why they're used and why we need to think about them uh, when processing our data. So moving on from the lin to log conversion, the next compression that's often applied is chroma subsampling. Uh, that's that 422 piece. Now, this is another mathematical trick. It also leverages how humans perceive color. Just like shadows, we tend to pay a lot of attention to contrast and less attention to subtle color differences. Chroma subsampling is just a way of getting rid of some of the color data without getting rid of the contrast data. Again, it's just another trick to reduce the size of the file based on how humans perceive images. Now, we don't need to get into the details of chroma subsampling because for the most part, we can ignore that it exists. It's not coming into play with respect to color spaces. Finally, uh, when saving to a hard drive, there can be lossless compression. This is just a computer algorithm that duplicates data across, deduplicates data across frames or across space. I'll give you an example. If in a scene, uh, the background doesn't move, the camera when compressing this might just say, okay, for the next 30 seconds, repeat this one pixel. That's going to be fewer bits to store than, you know, rewriting it every time for every frame. And then the net result of all this, when you add it together, is quite spectacular. We go from about 1.2 gigabytes per second of data all the way down to 150, which is going to give us way more uh, space on this hard drive to store data. So that's pretty much it. That's what uh, most of these cameras are doing when they're compressing data and saving it to a hard drive. So here's the whole thing by the numbers. Uh, the way to read this chart is you start with the raw file on the left, and then you incrementally apply the uh, transformations going right. And at each point, I've highlighted you know, where things change. And at the bottom, you see the reduced file size and the, the number of minutes you could store on a one terabyte hard drive. So the lin to log conversion takes us from 16 bits of color depth down to 10. The 422 chromosome sampling effective 
Li makes us go from three samples per pixel down to two. And then the three to one compression is just this straight compression that's applied at the end. And we go from only being able to store 13 minutes of data to over 100 minutes of data on a one terabyte hard drive. Feel free to go through these numbers. If anything's off, just let me know in the comments. All right, we care about HDMI though. So how does HDMI factor into all this? Now we saw that the size of the raw video stream got reduced when saving to a hard drive. What about when sending it out over a cable like HDMI or SDI or whatever? Turns out that uh, similar but slightly different things are happening over the HDMI cable. So we're still doing the linear to log conversion because the HDMI signal is only gonna send 10 bits of data instead of 16. So we still want that lin to log conversion. Uh, and a lot of the capture equipment that you have in cameras aren't gonna output uh, the 444 color samples. They're gonna output the chroma subsampled by 422 or 420. So those two steps are still being applied. Now, in the case of my camera, there's another step that's being applied here that doesn't get applied to the hard drive, which is a down sampling to 1080p. But the net result is that it's almost like applying this three to one conversion because it ends up being about 124 megs per second going over the HDMI cable. So here's the same table of information, but I've replaced the last column with a 1080p down sampling instead of that three to one conversion. Again, feel free to go through these numbers and if there's anything wrong, let me know. But we see here, okay, the HDMI cable is sending 124 megs per second. Why? Uh, in the case of a hard drive, it makes sense to try and minimize the file size. You can fit more footage on the hard drive. But HDMI is just a medium. Like once something goes in and comes out, it's it, we're not storing anything. So why is there this limitation? Why is there this compression? You know, is it is it the cables? Is it the connector? Like what is the problem? Well, we can actually have a look at the HDMI specifications. Uh, they're available along with the data rates that each version has. So if you look at this, uh, notice the HDMI one definitely doesn't have enough bandwidth to support a raw signal, that 1.2 gigabytes per second. Uh, and I would say even version 1.4 is pushing it because there's likely to be overhead, there's audio channels and other things that are probably going over the HDMI cable. But I think it's pretty clear like HDMI 2 and onward could easily support 4K 16-bit video stream 24 frames per second. Now, some cameras do output uh, raw HDMI. Uh, I have a, another camera that definitely does. Um, but why go all the way down to 124 megs per second in the case of my Blackmagic camera? I mean, it's unclear, but likely has to do with the cost of the components when the camera was being spec'd and manufactured. Um, either way, we're stuck with the choices of the past, but you know, now, you know, and you can figure out how to dig your way out of this kind of color space divot that we're in. All right. Deep dive over. I promise. Uh, you can take a moment to breathe again. Uh, now <laughs> let's rewind all the way back to what we were talking about at the beginning. So going back to the original problem, remember we said, uh, the camera's outputting black magic raw over HDMI, but now you can see exactly where that's coming from. You know, it's a manuscript. It's a manufacturer specific linear to log transform being used to reduce from 16 to 10 bits. And we also know that uh, if we feed the log format into Unreal, it's just gonna look wrong. We need to convert it. We want to essentially undo this step here. And it turns out that there's a few places you could do this, but the easiest is to undo it right in the camera. What we're gonna do is we're gonna generate a 3D LUT in DaVinci Resolve that LUT will be applied shortly before the image goes out over HDMI and it will reverse the linear to log conversion and then apply a Rec. 709 gamma curve. Once we have the camera sending Rec. 709 over HDMI, we can just use open color IO uh, on the Unreal side to convert between Rec. 709 and linear sRGB. You know, in addition, because Rec. 709 is just the default color space for HD video displays, uh, if we have one of those on-camera monitors or TV nearby, we can just view the signal and it will look correct without any further transforms. Now, the real important point here is we're not applying this to the file that's saved on the camera. That's still just a raw file in the original Blackmagic wide gamut color space. Uh, this LUT is only applying to the HDMI signal going out. So that's what we're gonna do in part two. Uh, thank you for joining me for part one that kind of covers everything. I hope you have more than enough information you need to really understand these color space conversions and transformations and you know how the LUT is going to come into play. Anyway, thank you and I'll see you next time.